Welcome to my crib. <laughs> Brent, I was trying to like run it through our head. Like, when did we meet? Was it like a decade ago? Like it? I have said that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, definitely probably near a muscle farm at some point, right? Probably cross past that. Yeah. So, 2010, 11, maybe something like that. Yeah, and I think that we, when you started Armada, probably like within the first year, I think we got connected, and then it was just a matter of like a bunch of clients working together and yeah. things like that. And then it's like our relationship progressed. Over yeah, a lot time. of mutual friends too. Yeah. Or, contacts and friends so yeah it's definitely progressed and you know we're excited to start this uh, little bit of a voyage with you yeah no this will be good I think this facility at least from all the pictures I've seen from the dirt up looks amazing so I'm glad I actually get to like check it out yeah, yeah so just to give a little context that we I mean we did not actually start the inside uh, manufacturing until February so we're sitting here in October so it's only eight months right so the office isn't completely done you can see we have the furniture there's still some things going we obviously save money for our customers. We still have plastic in here. Uh, but kidding aside, we're just glad to be in the office. The team had to work in trailers uh, in different like warehouse departments, you know, as we were getting going. So we started production at the beginning of September. This was still closed. So just to have the space is great. Obviously, by uh, probably the next month, we'll have the furniture be dialed in here. But most importantly, we'll go see what really makes this facility different, which is the manufacturing. Uh, a little bit later, I'll show you just up here in the office real quick. What kind of what we got going on? Open offices. Um, I'm working my way down to you. How are you doing? How are you doing? Good, man. What's up? Oh, look at these guys. Uh, you got cameras everywhere. Uh, this is Josh. Josh. This <laughs> hey, is Josh. Good to meet you. We've met Cross before. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, How's it going? This going? is Grant, who works with Josh. Hey, Grant. Nice to meet you. Good to meet this you. is going to be our tour guide slash captain in a little bit. Nice. Oh, yeah. We'll do, uh, we're bringing lunch in. After maybe lunch, we do okay. the tour. That cool. Works yeah, good. yeah. Larry, how you doing, man? Good. How you doing, Good to see you. It's a nice have an office, right? <laughs> yeah. I told them maybe we got plastic because we obviously give back to our customers and right. save money. And, I think uh, absolutely. frugality is like the ultimate form of creativity. I think that's like the part of it. You gotta, like you gotta start from I'm gonna it. use yeah. that. Like these floor, to, floor to ceiling windows, like yeah. match with plastic. I'm already seeing why you brought this guy. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, I think I told you a little bit, Josh, um, has a really good industri uh, industry insight, like does consulting for a lot of brands, CPG companies. Um, on LinkedIn, very active. Um, works with some manufacturers, not too many really. Um, I mean, I, as a consultant, I think it's like I'm agnostic to what the client needs. Like usually, you know, they have minimum quantities, they have specific needs or whatever those are. It's like you gotta match them up with what that partner is. But ultimately, you know, you vet the right ones and you make sure you only give people he the right. Like just to give us big shit. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like I know like yeah. what you guys yeah, want, like the what's in your right, wheelhouse, yeah. you know, because I don't even give you crap. I mean, like that's how it is. Like some people, they love the yeah. dirt, the mud, you know yeah. what I mean? Or you guys are progressed past we that. Like so it, it's just like, we're not set up for it. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. But I think that's something that we have to be cognizant of. I was saying to eventually like having a U-line to where we can do small runs to make sure you still keep betting on small brands mm -hmm. to like grow with them. Because if you become too big, you lose. Like Ghost is an example. We started yeah. day one with them. Prime example. Yeah. We would if we couldn't do it now. If they came in, we'd be like, mm, yeah. you're it. I'm sorry. Yeah. 
We're I, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, a super important in terms of like. But that's a I mean, the mixing the, the, the one in a million though. But. You got to mix risk <laughs> reward. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you guys have your bread and butter ones that are constantly making money, but then it's like if you don't bet on some of the innovative brands, especially when you're talking about like the sports space, like those things skyrocket. You know what I mean? Like they go. You don't even quick. have to understand. Like Dan reminded me again yesterday that <laughs> day one he told me they're like sales pitch, and I go, I literally like remember like it was yesterday. I go, I don't get it. Obviously me, the five that are like VPs status mm -hmm. higher that are shared with the rest. Have, like they already have enough of these offices already. Mm -hmm. So you have like your own R and D, you have your own customer service, your own lab. This will be the product development lab. So application lab, all the storage in there. Uh, it's pretty cool. They're going to put a bar actually right here, so when you're actually working on your natural lighting. Oh, which totally is yeah. sweet. So you're not just in the back dungeon of the lab. Yeah. This, and then we're going to do like couches, TVs, make this more like customer focus yeah. than just like an actual stiff lab like we have in Tennessee. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because I think that's a, a lot of times to speed up the process, people want to come and actually work in the lab because mm -hmm. you can get the samples in and out real quick and over like, send them in the snail mail, yeah. try oh, it, dude, that was feedback. The, this is the all the open office, this is the you know, customer service here. But like customer service, account management, um, all of that. So it should be really good. Cool. I'll actually introduce you with this. I didn't even know how to open the door, actually. Hey there, how are you? How you good? How you doing? Hey, I want to introduce you to Josh real quick. Um, to get some time for you later. Josh is a consultant, but obviously kind of an industry insider. Hey, Josh. Do, uh, nice to meet you. Some, uh, you. some uh, content on Armada. I think it'd be good to get you in here um, and go over kind of like where we're at, why you want to work for Armada, what separates us, all that good stuff. Okay. So kind of we can almost do like an appointment ad, if you will. Awesome. You up for that? Sure, why not? Yeah. Okay, you seem so enthusiastic. What, what the heck have I got to lose? Right. We got it. Very nice. To nice to meet you. you. You gotta tell everybody, they gotta get used to the cameras quick. Yeah, I didn't know you were coming. You know? <laughs> hey guys, it there's is, multiple cameras getting shoved in your face. It's a new world. Oh, it's a damn. These are nice. Sure, uh, Somebody in there? Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. <laughs> Get an Armada triangle in here. Nice. This is like, this is welcome to my crib status on the. Wow. Those are some fancy ass bathrooms. What are your initial thoughts so far of the office space? Been to a lot of contract manufacturers in my 12 years, and this one by far, at least aesthetically, is the most uh, uh, appealing to me, like most enjoyable to me. So I'm excited to see the rest of it, but this, like, just the office space, I know it's only partially done at this point, but. It's beautiful. I like the lights too. Like, yeah, there's a couple more coming over there. We're trying to go hex. And I just think the entrance, oh, cool like the entrance overall, I think is like, to me, super dramatic. Like when you come in, like you wouldn't expect to be coming into a contract manufacturer. Actually, no. It's more of a Which I think is great, brand. like upscale, like you feel. I like them in the carpet too, a little pop of the green. Yeah, yeah. yeah we get it. We replace a couple spots. Don't film that. <laughs> waterfall. Yeah. Be careful where I point to it. Uh, so, and, and that's so this this theme continues on, and that once our badging gets done, that's a secured entrance. This um, this is hallway goes all the other end. So our main employee entrance down there. So this is like 450 feet long this year. So this continues on, and this is like an overflow area. So once you're secured past this secured entrance here, you come in. There's some lounge seating, high top seating, um, and it's a mix of this and some tile that goes along here. So it kind of creates the path to there, but then you've got like a workspace, mountain view. We're going to do a Nagase Pranova mural on this wall. Oh, cool. The you reason the, the this is on the, the tape is on the wall. That's the that's the head print of one of the uh, construction guys. Get the fuck out of here. No, no kidding. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's 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 head grease. What the hell did he do? He ran into it with his head, thinking there was no glass there. Because they're used to just walking Shut through. Shut the fuck up. No, no. So we had to go back and put the tape on. That's when you like yeah. that, the CCTV cameras yeah. where you catch that. Well, we had them. They're on. It was pre that. Oh, they're all that <laughs> is awesome. So this space here, just to kind of give you an idea. Of the, you imagine being just watching that? Oh, yeah. yeah he drilled it, apparently. I, so, That's a legit mark right there. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, he wouldn't, yeah, that, he definitely left a mark. So this spot here that we're standing in, this would be kind of a collaborative area. So if you're, we've got some overflow space. If we're doing one of these things, right? Yeah. We got, you guys could actually come in here and set. We'd have a TV, we'd have a workstation, some lounge seating over cool. here. And then, because he's never off of his phone, like <laughs> about five minutes in between, he could go over, do a call, pop yeah. back out, go do a call, pop back out, right? Move and so all in one space and everybody can have their I own. I like so. that you guys are like, thinking about 
the experience that like if a customer wanted to come in and spend the day here, right. I think a lot of times you're like, where do I post up? Like, I feel uncomfortable. I feel crammed in. I don't know where to go. Where you guys are like, Rocker. okay, let's let's set it up where like people we welcome them in. They can feel comfortable. They can spend the day, mm -hmm. work through some innovation, work through whatever. If the product's running, they can check some yeah. QC stuff or whatever, and just it's a lot more inviting, which yeah. I think is great. Like. I don't think people think through that process. Yeah, we've learned from trial and error in Tennessee. Like we've had so many customers stay, which has been great at places we house people all the time, but it's it's not set up perfectly for yeah, it. Yeah, right? stuck in that, that conference room. Well, it's yeah. so far away from production. Yeah. The great part is here is we're gonna walk out these doors and you're mm -hmm. gonna be in production. I'm gonna tempt that one. Yeah. It'll be a one-way glass eventually too. But be right here. Next. Yeah. So th this was originally like customer service, but so we just like re rethought it, right? Yeah. From a customer, which I think is a smart idea. idea. It's customer collaborative. Yeah, so I love you, come, that. you could do exactly what you guys are doing upstairs. Have your own space. Bounce into the main conference room for you know to a more collaborative meeting with the Armada team or whoever. And then you guys need your own space. Boom! You come back over yeah. here. You got a private pod. You've got your own. Everything works. We're going to frost these windows to give some privacy, but still not you know take advantage of the light. Yeah. You know all throughout the space. Yeah. So that's good feedback. Especially like too though is like one thing that's crazy. Like we're now that we're not with startup brands. Brands are very particular to detail, so like that stuff does matter. It like, does. Yeah. It matters a lot. Like, I mean, you think about the type of owners now. And this is generalizing some of them, but I think who they are partnering with wants to resemble who they are. Oh, like, yeah. so they don't match up. And if you think about where things move from, like traceability or transparency, you're going to know who the partners are. They're yeah. going to know that Armada makes it, and then who are the suppliers that that Armada is using. All those things need to line up because if they don't, ultimately. You know, we're talking maybe 10, 15 years down the line. It is going to come up in the customer. Go, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like this. You, well, how do you partner with these people? But you're acting like you're this, or you're, you're you have that, or whatever. So I think it makes a lot of yeah. sense. It definitely does. Product, any powder flint, right? It, it all kind of flows the same. Raw materials in. What's that about room, me? Measuring. Yeah. Everything that's runs east-west right. through the building, and that'll be uh, why that's important to make more sense. Yeah. 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 We'll talk about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so on uh, here, we got to go check these out too. Uh, more bathrooms, more guys in bathrooms. I don't nice. know what kind of video we're posting. Armada has the most bathrooms. This is for the OnlyFans exclusive content. <laughs> Whoa. Nice clean locker So our whole team member experience too, right? It's about yeah. Yeah. being a preferred supplier, but also being a preferred employer. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a very competitive space. I think we're competitive on wages. We're not the highest, we're not the lowest, but we've, we've created a way for employees to improve and grow with the company with a very good starting wage. Yeah. But also when they come in the whole experience, like, yeah. hey, this is not the normal like yeah. home manufacturer yeah. locker room for yeah. sure. This would be like a public locker room. It's been it's been fun though, though. is like yeah. this is an example of like in Tennessee, we've kind of patchworked our locker room. Yeah. We're gonna put in the budget next year to redo it. So that you start kind of this is up in the game. So this hallway, I, I you kinda of tell we <laughs> when we look at some of the pictures where I show you some of that like where it's started, right? This was just freshly poured concrete, four walls. And as soon as we took over in the end of January, we came in and cut all this out. Put all the drainage in, a lot of steel that you'll see for all these mezzanines in the structure. Uh, we've got all this planned epoxy. It's not going to get done before the opening. Yeah. It's too many. It still looks pretty good. Though. But it looks pretty good. But, but, you know, over time, this will start chipping out. We'll start harboring yeah. just stuff that you can do. Is it going to be clear epoxy or you got like a, tall, like a tent? We got a tent of epoxy to go over. That way you hide all this. Yeah. So. Not a super hot day outside, but this is not kind of cold. This building is exceptionally well built in yeah. terms of insulation on the roof, on the walls, and everything. This is just ambient conditions. Uh, we're climate controlled in all the food production space, uh, but even at 100 degree days, we had a lot of here this year, this summer. You come inside, is it, it was easily a 20 degree difference, if not more, from outside yeah. to inside, just in the general space. So. Really, really nice building. All of these rooms have high speed doors on both sides, positive air pressure, so we're pushing air out instead of sucking air in. And we have eight individual rooms, so we can work on eight production work orders at any one time. We have two operators in each room, so there are scales uh, on, the, on the benches, on the floors, barcode scanners, iPads for all the operators to interact with our quality system, our maintenance system, our production system. Um, we measure all that out, everything then, uh, what material we of course don't consume go, gets relabeled, goes back in inventory, and then the rest of it comes out and gets paired up with full pallets material, ready to go in the blending process. No wood pallets in the production process, so anything that comes in on wood, we take it and put it on plastic. Um, anything that we transfer, we put on plastic, and everything then goes up to the up to the deck for blessing. So in context, we have four weigh rooms in Tennessee, we have eight here. So 
which is a lot of times when we get going and we're blending a lot, our biggest constraint inside uh, Tennessee is the measuring process. I think that's an important point where you're saying, you know, you went through the process with the Tennessee facility and obviously you, you know, made do and, and, and iterative and kind of did it, but when you're starting fresh, you're like, okay, where are our bottlenecks at? Where do we know, like, we're always kind of struggling to get quicker? and then you can improve that here. Yeah, so we, I mean, that's why you'll see a change in blending. Like Tennessee, I mean, honestly, out of most country manufacturers, facilities, really good. I mean, volume that we put out of theirs is about as big as any site in the US, so not bad by any means, but like, I think if we, we decided to change the blending process, and we use ribbon blenders in Tennessee, which have got us through, they work big volume, but here, um, and this has been great, Jason came from a company who previously used it, but it's called Maccon which we'll go to. So the biggest change is our blending system, but then obviously how we're feeding it too is we know long-term our biggest bottleneck will be legit blending measuring. So obviously more rooms, a different blending system that's a little less constrained by the amount of blenders you have. Now there's blend stations we'll go into, but the beautiful part is uh, when Jason took the project over, we actually expanded it. The first phase was literally to get to where we would be today, and then we'd have to expand. What they did is we ran basically the whole building, the electrical, the HVAC, everything for phase two, which phase two is sitting on Jason's desk to put the orders in. Yep. So we're actually already gonna double our blending here in the next, we'll order it probably quarter one, we'll start the process. Yep. Uh, but that was a great thing we did, it was by getting it all ready. So we won't have to stop production. We're just gonna add actually more to it. So that was a huge thing, whereas Tennessee, the way it's set up is you'd have to stop a lot. Yep. And so, yeah, and we'll, Jason will go into the well, MacCon system. Case in point, so as we touch on that, so as we we have a mezzanine deck, we have three mezzanines in the building. So we're 438,000 square feet on one level. We have three mezzanines, one office with conference room training, all that we need there, right? And then two production mezzanines. This mezzanine, we basically take the raw material up, goes up an elevator shaft, goes across the deck, and then there's an, a, a, a room above, immediately above this, it looks identical. We dump that powder down through the floor, and it goes in those large stainless steel bins called an IBC. That's part of the MATCON system. So um, everything is all completely enclosed in those rooms, positive air pressure. Um, so in terms of just uh, from an allergen control, customer to customer, uh, cross-contamination control, um, honestly, in, best in the industry. There's nothing like it. We've been in a lot of powder plants you have too. So just in terms of that, being a co-manufacturer, we're setting, a new, setting the standard, you know. So this process, and we're not actually blending here now, we're caught up with blending, they're weighing out more, but those large IBCs attached to this machine, and I, I can show another video, and we can, we can add one there yeah. too, and, and perhaps we'll shoot video. Um, but basically it clamps in place and then it just spins. It's a very, uh, the, product, the process is very low impact to the product. So it's not like a traditional blending system where you have moving parts inside and you can get a lot of shear or you, you can break down the material. Um, and also just the way it blends, you get from top to bottom uh, consistency. Um, the homogeneity from top to bottom is, is what you pull from the top, the middle or the bottom, you get the same product. Um, the, uh, each of the IBCs, um, well, you know, they're 3,100 liter. They hold is, is the size of them, so they're, they're roughly eight feet tall. Uh, they can hold up to 5,000 pounds of dry material, um, and you know we're blending in 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the product. So we're the only company in the state of Utah, not even Powders Nutraceutical, to have this system. Um, large investment. It's best in class for what it is, and it's something that uh, um, I, I think that it's going to confirm the set of support. We have. The extra space there, again, we have two more that can go side by side. Everything is there, ready to go. Buy the equipment, plug it in, and we double and then triple our blending capacity. And from like a real simplistic perspective, like why customers like this outside of efficiency, um, two parts is uh, contamination. So it's a, it's a sealed, obviously, container. So there's obviously it's being tumbled. There's not a room where powder is flying. It's being contaminated. So there's almost no risk at all for contamination. And then two, the room that's back there you'll see it is basically going to be what we call it is like a dishwasher, but uh, it'll be all of the vents and everything will be actually put in this machine that actually cleans it. So it's not really done by human that's made for these bin systems. So that'll be a huge thing. And the cleaning time is relatively short. Yeah, a few minutes of bin. Yeah. You know, so oh, three to four from uh, completely uh, dirty IBC to clean, sanitize and dry on a conveyor. So it's like a large car wash. Yeah. Um, 
that goes in there. And that's just another thing, even auditors, for example, like that because it's like less of a it's less of a human potential error. It's a machine that's obviously been validated. Um, there's so many different reasons from a contamination allergen perspective. People like this system versus open room ribbon going yeah. and so on and so forth. So that's the interesting. And then the last piece is you can layer, which I think Jason kind of alluded to from top to bottom. But you can basically pre-blend within the blender. So like a lot, you know, like in. Tennessee, if we do a pre-blend, we're doing a blend, then mixing another blend. This, you're actually layering. Mm. So, like, you know, if you have, like, you know, very small inclusions of, like, different yeah, B vitamins. Yeah, where it's trace. So, it's a huge advantage, too. So, those are some cool things about it. So, these are these are temporary setup. We've, uh, done it as we evolve with the project, we're trying to add more new portals, right? So you can see without having to go in and disrupt the process. Uh, we have some of our ventilation or dust collection is just now coming online. Uh, so, you know, this is our, our heaviest powder production in terms of throughput. Uh, but dual head filler, this is a, will be a completely automated line. We have a couple of pieces of automation yet to come in here. Again, anything controls or electrical related is, and especially right. anything that came north of the border or across the pond or we're much, much longer delay. So, um, but uh, this is what we call our auto line. So we're fully automated from front end to back end, all the palletizing once it's complete. We're probably still 10 to 12 weeks from the full thing being complete all the way up to the palletizer. So uh, early Q1 uh, at this point. But um, this is uh, really a tool to make granular products, so pre-workouts, aminos, metropics, you know, anything that uh, has a high bulk density and small bulk. built out. Uh, we've got you know temporary wiring cable on the floor. Everything goes up overhead, uh, gets up out of the way. Uh, most importantly, the first thing to point out is everything that comes out of any of the GMP food safety rooms is all completely sealed and closed, no open product. Uh, everything then goes through an x-ray machine, so we've standardized a metal or Toledo x-ray. Uh, most of our competition uses the metal detection, uh, so metal detection only detects metal, right? So any form of material based on a certain size, you know, down to a smaller size, uh, typically around five to seven millimeters, it's going to detect whether it's plastic, it's wood, it's metal, it's glass. It will detect it and kick off as a reject. So uh, each of the lines is standardized to that, and then uh, on down it goes to labeling and packaging. some of the automation that's still coming yet, uh, but it's all factored into this line for the final build out. And then at the end of the line where we're hand case packing, this line has an automatic case packing solution, uh, stretch banding for you know six count, eight count, um, if it goes into retail, some of those are and then a full automated palletizing at the end. So there's little to no human touches of actual product on It becomes replacing material, uh, loading up a, a, you know, a, a printer, a labeler, that type of thing replacing the cardboard and pallets and things in a, in a palletizer. So fully automated. And then the next iteration of this packaging area is to automate the entire end of the line. So it's case packing, palletizing, uh, so little to no human touch even in the line. So this is our, go our uh, bulk line. Uh, for pre-mixed product, so energy drink product. Uh, there you go, you can go little ghost right here. 25 oh. kgs in a, in a box. So yeah, this is um, this is pre-mix. Um, I have to say, for people that don't yeah. understand pre-mix, like for, for energy drinks, I think good, that's like a confusing... This is a plug for Arma uh, the Armada Solutions <laughs> thing too. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> so um, one thing that's been nice about our business is we've evolved. We obviously are a contract manufacturer. Typically, we're running bottles like you saw over there. Um, and that is the name of the game. Um, over the last three, four years, we've really uh, grown to go after a lot of pre-mix business, really specific to the energy drink market. It's growing, and basically that a lot of them have active ingredients in there. So if you look at a panel of like a Ghost or even a C4, they have a lot of sports nutrition ingredients in there versus just like caffeine flavor water, right? Yeah, you have like I think with C4 or like Smart Energy, you have like Cognizant or yeah. whatever. You know, and like then I mean Ghost has like an active yeah, of carnitin, yep. uh, carnitine. 
Uh, they got estrogen, they got neurofactor, yep. things like that. So regardless, we love blending powder. The bottlers in uh, this space, they just want to drop powder in solution and they have extremely high speed lines. We've seen them go 1,000, 1,500 uh, cans per minute. They don't want to stop. So we'll do the blending, we'll do the powder, we'll drop it off. They'll basically just drop this in solution and run. So we've got our, um, you know, really evolved our business to doing pre-mix. So this is a bulk line. We'll talk about what we're doing this. We want to make this eventually fully automated. Pernova has a division called uh, Pernova Solutions. So Pernova being our parent company, um, they had done a division that was just pre-mixed, mainly vitamin, mineral pre-mixes for big CPG companies. What we're doing is actually now with the growth of Armada and the growth of Solutions, we're actually combining the two companies. Um, and next year it'll be marketed as Armada and we'll have Illinois, Tennessee, and Utah. Difference is Tennessee and Utah will also do the packaging. Illinois will just be a pre-mixed facility. They'll focus probably a little bit more on the uh, infant formula, some of the CPG companies. The Tennessee and Utah facility really focusing on kind of the beverage sector. And uh, Utah's facility really being kind of probably our bigger volume. We put in a uh, higher speed line and then Jason had some plans to even automate it a little bit further. So this is a growth opportunity. So, and again, you know, final uh, inspection process, x-ray, standardize all the lines. Uh, one of the biggest x-rays you can buy in the industry, so it's, uh, you, can fit a, you can fit a person through there. We don't, but that's what we, <laughs> that's actually put Josh we stress yeah. that, right? A portion of where, you know, we expect our business to grow is uh, this area. We're really uh, focused, targeting some of the bigger um, beverage brands, and uh, we love this business. And also, there is a... Um, massive bottler that just opened up literally probably what Jason two miles the way the crow flies uh, called Perfect. Vobev um, it's 800,000 square feet of production yeah 400,000 of warehouse so it's 1.2 million um, they look to be very disruptive in the space uh, they're actually building their own cans on site again the way the facility was built not only in the internal space right we've already got expansion built in all the major infrastructure but as we look to expand as you can see we have a lot of space we don't have to disrupt any of the production. You put a, a west wall, a north wall, and an east wall, you have another whole space, and then we can build inside it completely uninterrupted the current production processes. So from a personnel safety, food safety, quality standpoint, and just overall, you know, keeping customer commitments um, and not shutting down production, we're set up that that's the way the facility is. You got out. inbound on that side, which then goes into the raws where you guys were, and then obviously we use these docks for Outbound. Everything yep. comes. Everything goes east to yep. west. We actually we come through and we'll and then shrink wrap into storage and out. So we're gonna we're gonna warehouse for a couple of customers in the beginning. Pernova is probably gonna build here, but inevitably we'll want to look at eventually building something out as a diversified offering, right? Whether yeah. It's gummies, whether it's septic, whether it's carbonation. Not, we want to do some. And that's part of the reason why we chose 438,000 yeah. square feet. We obviously don't need this day one. I think that's a good, I mean, as you know, talk about the shift from like sports to active nutrition and like the formats that then more mainstream consumers want, it's like, it's more food, it's more beverage, it's more, I guess it's a little bit of pill fatigue or even powder fatigue in yeah. some sense where like they do, when you, when you take on a client or a customer, like they want to have a lot of different innovation options and they don't necessarily want to have maybe the my most diverse. But we also look at it a little bit differently. Is like we do want to service our current customers, but we also want to branch out into yeah. other areas too. Like, so doing like, you know, septic RTDs, okay, cool. We know one brand of ours that great fit, yeah. but that's also another audience, yeah. right? So that also is an interesting thing for us. I wonder what like the football field, like equivalency, because like most people when they're looking at like very big spaces, they're like, oh, you know, like five football fields or 10 football fields. I don't know how many football fields this is, but it feels like a lot. I don't know what it is. This is crazy. Brent, how many football fields is this? That's a great question. Because um, <laughs> the camera doesn't do it justice. It's, it like looks it so much more on screen. screen. It's crazy. Like, it's just insane how big it is. Like, I don't think yeah. people, if they're not here, they don't realize like how big it is. Yeah, you don't even you don't really like know that there's an office over there. Yeah. Right? I mean... Football right, yeah. 12, like football big, 12 football fields. Yep. Yeah, almost. 12 football fields. We may have a record league out here. We could at least spare one. Right? One. Get the package yeah. out here. This is like the um, <laughs> the supplement candy land, or what do you what do you call this? Like Willy Wonka, this the supplements? Is, yeah. yeah, it is. It is. We, we kind of 
This is the first time we built it and hope they come. <laughs> uh, you can see right here we have WPC80. What that is is whey protein concentrate, sunflower, Laprino. Laprino is a Denver-based company, privately held. Uh, you can look it up. They have some interesting articles. It's still privately held. I think they, it's like they have an article that the owner is like 82 years old. And it's like the richest, quietest, four billion yeah. guy you've ever met. The cool thing about this is it's all mozzarella cheese. That's why we like it. So basically, the consistency of the color and taste is always spot on. It's only mozzarella cheese. A lot of the other guys, you know, mix. They buy different uh, from different farms, so on and so forth. Cool thing about Laprino is uh, cheese is their number one game. They have a 100% supply of Papa John's, Domino's, and Little Caesars. Three biggest pizza chains in the U.S. They have a 100% cheese supply. Last tidbit, <laughs> they created, I think, one of the greatest foods of all time, stuffed crust pizza. <laughs> the, or the, or the cheese. <laughs> and think about that. What a genius idea, yeah. right? They needed to find a way to sell more cheese. What they do, they stuffed it in the actual crust and <laughs> sold it. Brilliant. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So something that I guess I want to ask you is that this is... I would say, arguably, in the U.S., probably one of the meccas of like nutraceutical manufacturing. Because of that competition, you know, brand new facility. Like from a recruitment and all that standpoint, like how's everything been? Well, the market's tough, as I'm sure you're yeah. aware, <laughs> um, and it's softened for a little while. But the interest that we're getting is phenomenal, and the quality of people that we're getting. So we're kind of in a really unique position because we could pick and choose what yeah, we want it's good. versus having to be pigeonholed so it's been it's been a lot of fun it's been very interesting and meeting people and getting to know them and their background has been even more interesting it's awesome so it we're getting there it's it's yeah. tough but we're getting there does it make you nervous all that space equals then multiplying people over time i mean what's <laughs> kind of the play <laughs> as i see all that space i'm like that's gonna be you know, go from that's 100 to gone. 200 to 2000 yes. to it you know <laughs> exactly it's it's exciting when you stop and you think about it obviously the building is beautiful uh, like construction everything like that so when you're coming in and you're thinking about you know working at a place like that i think you're proud of coming to work you know what i mean i think anytime we're talking about this like we just went through this like time where everybody's working from home well i know like when you're here sometimes you know everybody in the back starts to come here but yeah. you know you still have i think an element of wanting or having things that are above and beyond just getting paid that brings you in and wants you to keep coming into the office and i think one the, the building but i think team you know anybody that i've met both from here and the tennessee facility great people great people to work for so i mean like I think all that stuff cumulative is going to be in your favor I mean, when you guys are looking for for people. That's the culture that we're trying to build, though, is we want people who are going to come in and not just look at it as a job, whether it's hourly, whether it's salary, whatever the case may be. I want to see them come into work. I want to be able to say hello to them. They smile back at me. They say hello. And it's a culture. So it starts from the bottom up and it continues and it's up to us as management teams to continue that and make sure that 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 takes place and if it's not then we're definitely going to see some changes yeah and we don't want that at all <laughs> we want to keep it positive i want people working here i want them staying here we're we're willing to invest in them i want them to feel that that this isn't just a place for them just to come and work their 6 to 430 or whatever yeah. that there's opportunities for growth and and opportunities for additional placement should they want it. I think that's, I mean, those are the type of people you want to not just be coming in and, and getting that paycheck, but thinking about this as a place of like, my ultimate, I guess, dreams could be filled if as long as I work hard and I just kind of keep you know, getting that opportunity. I mean, I'm thinking, I grew up in a totally different place in Northeast Ohio, though it's still in manufacturing, but, but more that dirty steel manufacturing or whatever, I don't think I would have ever signed up for that, but I think here I probably would have, like if I was an 18 year old kid, maybe I didn't want to go to college or anything like that, I would be like, oh, this would be a great place to start out and maybe I could kind of get up there because there's so much, I mean, you walk in here the first time, I just wouldn't think somebody would not be able to see the opportunity in front of them. I just, I don't know, it just seems like you walk in the door and you're like, whatever I want to make out of this, I can make out of it. And that's, but that's what we want is, is in order to retain people, you want to make sure that you're offering a dream. So I plan on retiring here, which isn't very long from now, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I want other people to retire from here as well though. You know, I don't want them to just come in again and look at it as I just come in and I punch a clock and yeah. I go home. There's opportunity for here, 
we're going to provide growth. We're, there's leads, there's supervisors, and there's all different tiers that we're looking at doing and making sure that everybody has that opportunity if they want it. Yeah. That's what it's going to come down to. But we want them to want yeah. it. And we need people to understand that, you know, you don't, you can walk in from the street and you can learn and you can go forward. Yeah. You don't absolutely have to have a degree, you know, and you, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Yeah. Make a career. Yeah. Absolutely. Everybody's got to start somewhere. But That's if Elon Musk wants a job, Brent, she's got, he's got a job or no? <laughs> Okay, I just figure. <laughs> I guess I was thinking, yeah, in terms of, I you know we mentioned before, we didn't know exactly like when our origin story started, but it made me think about just the origin story of Armada. It started in 2016, but maybe let people know kind of the how that all evolved with Pernova. Like you were at Pernova before, maybe, maybe people don't necessarily even know. Pernova. Pernova or the scale yeah. of Pernova yeah. and then you know I think the transaction later on with Nagasi like how that all yeah. not only is you know makes sense in, in the story but also like from maybe somebody that would want to work with you guys like why is that even yeah. important that you guys have that type of ownership structure because I think it does provide a unique element in terms of maybe quality control or even from just the expectations financially or whatever those things yeah, are I think there's a lot of those layers that like people just overlook and they just they maybe they saw the headline and they're like I don't know what that under I don't know yeah. what that means but it actually does mean a lot for like a brand that wants to mm -hmm. work with you yeah for sure there's a little bit of element of security uh, with the brand now with the employee right so we started in 15 um, in Illinois and I had worked for Pernova um, for eight years before that eight nine years different capacities at the end I was running their nutrition division uh, in Europe and the US and we were basically Pernova is a distributor basically at heart and a distributor meaning they actually buy product and sell product they're not a broker they actually take products in they buy from the manufacturer they were one of the first to actually go to China and take ownership of that putting people on the floor their own employees not brokers so that one there's a chain of custody there's quality controls in place so they really develop relationships in China and became the largest in vitamin C amino acids some sweetener some essential and so they started building these crazy uh, buying powers in these categories then they got into um, flavor manufacturing, which was really interesting. So they wanted to add an element to innovation. So they did that, not just to be a distributor. Then they bought a small premix company, which we talked about premixes earlier. It's basically taking, um, in this case, it was vitamin blends for CPG companies. So they had all these different layers, but the, the heart of it was it was a distributor, a very large distributor, probably the largest US uh, food distributor. And they also have a big arm in, in Europe. So I worked for that division and I had just a blast in the nutrition division, working sometimes with brands on a flavor, or even in some cases making them aware of their supply chain, doing some contracts with them, and then working with the co-man delivering those products. So I got an interesting side of um, brand contract manufacturer, then also being the supplier. So it always was a, you know, it was a quick learning curve for me because I got my hands into all that. What I did learn over time is like, Pernova was vertically integrated, but we were missing the last piece, which was contract yeah. manufacturing. We toyed, and this is an open conversation for years, and if we wanted to do it, because we sold a lot of contract manufacturers. But where this industry is going and how it's evolving is there's consolidation. People are getting bigger. So we started Armada in Illinois, and um, honestly, didn't think it was going to scale like we did. We were like, hey, let's do this as an added service, see where it goes. Uh, first three months after we LLC the company, we had sold way more than we could handle. Um, just because once we kind of threw it out there, people were like, oh, you're vertically integrated, you have flavors, like why wouldn't we want to throw something at you? We had great customer service, we weren't ready for what was gonna come. So we started looking at uh, acquisitions um, and actually like we were in 7,000 square feet of GMP facility in 15. Then uh, we were looking for 50,000. Next thing you know, we're visiting Tennessee, which uh, Josh knows because he has he worked with Muscle Farm, who had done some business there and actually had a warehouse. We uh, went and looked at a company called Capstone, who had a facility in Spring Hill, Tennessee, only open for one year. Different things you can go read and, and uh, Google why what happened to them, um, but they just they basically had an issue, and the PE company decided to sell the assets of the Spring Hill facility and keep the Utah facility open. We went there like kind of a look but don't touch mentality because like, I mean, we were three months old. <laughs> yeah. um, I know from my cash perspective, I didn't have the money to do that. And um, so we went there, looked, 
and we kind of thought about it on the flight back and like we started talking on the flight back and it went from like no chance to like we're kind of the what ifs yeah and then by the time we landed we're like let's pursue this in a different way so we ended up um we knew the general manager um peter miller at the time had a pretty good relationship with him and uh we ended up uh you know getting an opportunity where this was april of 16. they were closing the facility for june of 16. so for us it was really instrumental that we would uh to keep the facility open because yeah. if you close it and you lose the people the employees, kind yeah. of, right so we had to accelerate one the whole due diligence the purchase agreement all that got that done and um you know the cool part was we got to hire they had at the time they did some layoffs before that but they had 110 employees and we took on 104 of the 110 so we wow. kept those people employed which was a really cool story so that was more operations manufacturing. We took the commercial team, which I had built in Chicago, which was R&D, purchasing, and sales, and brought them down to Tennessee and kind of mix it with that operation. And at the time, we needed 30 people. We did not need 125. So we, you know, we had a runway of, we need to get to this amount this quick or else this thing gets really <laughs> ugly really fast. So the pressure was on and then uh, just a little backstory, I don't even know if I've told Josh this is, we went to take over the facility uh, June 30th and I can openly say this now is uh, we bought an NSF facility and when we took the facility over, there was, it was not an NSF facility, there was no SOPs, everything was white. <laughs> So when we started July 1st, literally walked out to a crowd of 104 people without a working computer or any production. So it was a very like humbling and scary sight. It was like, okay. So we had to build every single SOP out. We had to build the lab back out for testing methods and we had to start from scratch. So the month of July of uh, 7th or 16, if you knew me, you did not want to be around me. Um, but what a resilient freaking team. You combine the Pernova team that we've mixed in that became Armada and then the capstone facility that became Armada. And like, there was a bond at that month where they were happy to be employed so they didn't mind actually having to start from scratch. We were so naive and we didn't know any better. Like, let's just do this. And uh, you know, things, went 16 17 we started getting the groove got some interesting customers who and part of this whole backstory is we accelerated faster because of the interlinking with pernova so when we went to go sell our story uh you know i owned a portion of the company and pernova did which is really um, a guy named don thorpe and ron jurgens and um you know we had the backing of them so yeah. somebody would be like hmm, you're kind of the new kid on the block how are you validated? Well, at the time we have a $700 million distributor that has inventory helping us float. So we got some big breaks yeah. early on. So we got the scale um, pretty fast. 17, 18, we focused on just scaling up, continuous improvement and started really humming. In 18, 19, we were, in my eyes at the time, blowing out of the water. <laughs> obviously looking back, obviously there's a lot of things we could have done, but uh, interesting opportunity came. Um, Don, who's the owner of Pernova, um, had an opportunity to sell the company. And it wasn't really on the cards, it wasn't something we we're looking to do. I, particularly for Armada, was, you know, we're year four going yeah. up. I did not want to even really entertain it. But then uh, they wanted to buy the whole company, they wanted to buy Pernova. And then Armada was a separate LLC, um, but they wanted to, to roll it in yeah. and do it. And uh, I was kind of, a, it, I'm going to say against it, but it wasn't the right time for me started talking, all the companies that were interested were all uh, strategic. And obviously you've done a lot of videos yeah. on this is, you know, there can be somewhat strategic PE, but there's there's PE and there's really strategic and two levels, there's a lot of some other things, but like strategic, the company that I'm buying us, which we'll talk about is called Nagasi. They are a couple different layers of uh, things, but they are a food company and an electronic company. The food company wanted to expand in North America and Europe, and they saw that they've tried many times to put you know, their people here and it just didn't go. Um, so they decided, hey, an acquisition's what we want to do to grow the business. Then they got in and realized all the things we were doing, and uh, it was just a great fit. They really you know, wanted to just give us the capital to, to grow it, which we would need. And also, you know, infrastructure. We were so lean and mean to scale and to think bigger 
they, you know, they're eight, at the time they were an eight billion dollar um, company with just more resources, uh, more intellect that could help expand, more strategic people, and they helped us on that side. But they did not really want to touch the kind of like high energy entrepreneurial spirit of Pernova Armada. So you know, we're sitting here three and a half years later, and they have not slowed the train down, and we're sitting here a much healthier company. Um, when we sold to today almost have doubled the Pernova business in three and a half years. Mm. So great, a lot of good people a part of that, but if we did not actually do the acquisition, there is no chance we would have uh, been able to do that from just a cash flow perspective. And you gotta remember during COVID, supply chains worsened to ever. So the amount of inventory you were carrying, yeah, we, they let us be opportunistic and build good relationships with customers by holding more inventory. Right, because you couldn't control how long things were sitting at port. You couldn't do this, couldn't do that. Some people were restrained in cash, so Nagas is like, "This is an opportunity to show customers who we are, what we do." So they allowed us to go way beyond what the working capital requirements were and hold inventory. And we grew the business, and we're heading in now to where the supply chains are getting a little better. But we've had a lot of loyalty and a lot of companies who we've been validated with because of Nagas's backing. Right, so when you tie it all in, is like. You know, we started Armada because of Pernova, the vertical integration, the flavors, all that. And then um, the Nagasi piece wasn't part of the strategy, but looking to where we are today, sitting here in Utah, we would not have built this facility if Nagasi hadn't come in, right? We had kind of some blueprints for it. We were thinking much smaller if we were even gonna do it. We literally, first six months after Nagasi had bought us, we're going to a board meeting to approve this. And so this is their biggest greenfield project they've ever done. It shows the confidence, but also shows that this is you know a big piece for their strategy of growth. Yeah. So yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. And uh, you know they've been uh, a catalyst to our growth, but haven't slowed down kind of the entrepreneurial spirit of Pernova and Armada. No, it's great. I mean, I think the serendipitous um, slash a little sometimes a little bit of luck happens in, in business where mm -hmm. like partners or, or things come up where. You know, they weren't in the plan, but now that you look back, if you can't understand how it could be any other way, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So yeah, for sure. I think that's, that's the good thing about it. And what you kind of mentioned around, you know, if it's 2020 or 2021, or even now, or even the next couple of years, like when you are in a position of kind of strength or whatever, and there's blood in the streets, they say, this is the best time to go hunt. Yeah. Like, you know, you're so, right. like if you, they gave you the opportunity to not feel like you had to be on edge, that you could stay the course with the vision, stay the course with what yeah. you want to do, but have the flexibility to go out and get a little bit risky when other people were, you know, kind of backing risk off. off or not even. Yeah. There. So it's really, like you said, great that it came to when it, when the timing happened, yeah. but also just how it came to be. But, because yeah. again, if you were by your own, or yeah. even just with Pernova, you probably would have had a much different situation. In the last much more years. defensive, yeah. much more, kind of, yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, we look at, you said a really good point is we look at 2023 and people have been asked so many times, like, oh my gosh, you have to be very scared. You are opening a brand new facility heading into a recession. Of course, there's a little bit of unknown and you know, you gotta be a little nervous or else you just, you're cold blooded. But at the same time, we look at it as what you said is like, it's an opportunity. People are starting to do things that aren't even sometimes rational because they're getting scared and they're making decisions to kind of roll back the business before it even necessarily goes bad. They're anticipating, right? Yeah. So what we're trying to do is be more offensive and do things a little bit differently um, and attack in moments when people are kind of going back, right? We're hiring, we're innovative, we're expand we're already going into phase two in Utah, which is like, you know, if you look from afar, like what are they doing? Um, there's a level of confidence, but at the same time, I think like, you know, it's 2023 is going to be difficult Yeah. in, um, you know, we don't have a money tree with Nagasi by any means, but like, you know, cash is going to be king in 2023. And I think we're set up financially to, to help support our customers and the big guys are going to realize that. And I think start to understand that even yeah. more. So I think it's, it's an offensive mode in 2023 versus a sit back and play defense. Yeah, Cause I think anything from like a vendor standpoint, if you are feeling like you have an opportunity and you want to be able to grab it during 2023, you also have to think about who are your partners and if they're going to be able to actually, I don't want to say stay in business, yeah. but, but be able to you know, support your growth. Yeah. And if they can, or you're, you're questioning that a little bit, 
you have to go with people that you think are going to be in a position that can fuel your growth, yep. which, like you said, this all kind of feeds into that because I think... Uh, and they want the same in return, right? Yeah. They're, they're the ones being aggressive and bullish on what they're going to do, but then they want to work with people who they know are going to yeah. line up. You don't want to hear like, oh, we can only run so much because... Yeah. We're not going to tell you why, but it's because we really can't handle buying extra material. We can't because it's it's hurting our bottom line. And yeah. like they need to be with partners that are in in a strength position yeah. that can actually say, "Hey, wherever you want to grow with this, we're yeah. with you." One hundred percent. But you, you said something too that's interesting. Is like in contract manufacturing, and we keep evolving and getting better at this, especially from where we were day one. But like you know, you're only as good as your customers yeah. in a lot of reality, right? So uh, vetting, being strategic talking to even people like you to understand like, you know, data and trends and kind of like, are we thinking the right things, right? That all matters because like you spend so much time on these brands. If you're not betting on the right ones, uh, you know, you could be great. You could man be a great manufacturer. You could be very innovative, but if you just have the wrong five brands and their business plan yeah. is not good, 2023 is going to be a bad year for you. So it's a interesting, you could, you, you don't really fully control your destiny in contract manufacturing, but you do because you actually vet, you build those relationships yeah. and you, you need to understand. And that's why I love like talking to you is like, I think some contract manufacturers maybe don't get into the weeds about understanding brands and influencers and all that. But like it's, it's a huge piece of yeah like what we're going to do. Right? I mean, when we talk about, you know, who you guys work with or who you want to work with, a lot of times we're talking about what's their channel mix, what's their product mix, what are right. they doing in the market? Because Diversification is not just you know customer number. It's also how do those customers yeah. operate in the environment? How are they dealing with the, the competitive environment? All, because all that matters when you know even like something we talked a lot during like 2020 when like the shit hit the fan and like things just shut off, went to zero, and it was like sometimes you need to understand okay a deeper kind of yeah. uh, you know understanding of what are my customers doing? Yeah, maybe you're putting still orders in, but like are they actually just trying to run through a wall or are they yeah. are they being strategic yeah. and understanding that there's things ahead of them that they're gonna have to get around and they're gonna have to figure out and i think like you mentioned i don't think a lot of the supply side necessarily goes through that process yeah. and that for me at least as a strategist i think of that as like that's huge risk layers because it's also, I, <laughs> yeah I, it's that and i just i mean i find that part so fascinating and interesting yeah. So it's like, I talked to some different guys who run commands and they see some great numbers from companies and they don't know, oh, it's, well, the problem is it's 80% one retailer. Yeah. yeah. That one retailer goes down yeah. or has too much inventory. Well, then you don't have orders the next month, right? So that's what you and I have talked about sometimes. It's like I look at a customer and like look at the buckets of where they're selling. Yeah. Are they risk adverse? How much do they control off their website? You know, blah, blah, blah. And that then makes you feel more comfortable of going. Yeah. Right. Then food, drug, mass versus re, uh, yeah. specialty, two different things. Too. Bit, I mean, I, I think that maybe this doesn't get talked about often in the space, but I know I've brought it up to you and a lot of other people is like, yeah, you are running manufacturer. Yeah. You're like, but from the customer side, it's really like you're taking like a venture um, approach to like you're betting on brands. You're hoping yeah. those brands do well. You need to hit on a certain percentage of them to to continue to grow. Yeah. yeah, sometimes you're gonna not get them all right, but if you don't have a deep understanding of the space, like I don't know how you make those bets yeah. appropriately. And like, who you spend time on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, oh man, I look at 16 and 17. <laughs> I had some Sammy Sosa numbers at times, you know, hit a couple home runs, but man, I struck out quite a few times too. <laughs> so. You ain't gotta go home, but you can't stay here. 